South Shore Joint. Sorry, I had to stop because I got the this is being recorded message. Okay, so um, my name, oh, I just have to click this. So my name is Amy Bodman. I'm a board member of the South Shore Joint Initiative. And it is my great pleasure to introduce naturalist extraordinaire, David Bree. I know David chiefly through the Prince Edward County Field Naturalists, which he helped found in 1997. Since then, David and his wife Yvette, another extraordinary naturalist, have dedicated a good portion of their busy lives to promoting awareness of this region's precious natural heritage, both within their work lives and outside of them training and inspiring young naturalists, leading educational walks, giving talks, participating in our South Shore BioBlitzes and Biothons, and contributing their immense scientific knowledge to studies about the area. David has had an illustrious career with Ontario Parks. He recently retired as the Chief Park Naturalist at Presqu'ile Provincial Park, and formerly worked at Charleston Lake, Bonneco, and Petroglyphs Provincial Parks. Although he graduated with a degree in geology and continued with postgraduate studies in that field, David has become one of the foremost experts on damselflies and dragonflies in Ontario, and also is an expert ornithologist, lepidopterist, and all around extraordinary naturalist. In the early 2000s, he compiled and edited a series of three volumes summarizing Prince Edward County's natural history. Although David has recently retired, he is as busy as ever. We are so pleased that he has agreed to give this talk tonight on moths and butterflies in celebration of our flight of the Monarch Day this coming Saturday. Thank you. Thank you very much, Amy. Uh, I wouldn't go so far as to say an expert, but definitely enthusiast of all, of all living things. And I'm going to just talk a little bit here with a PowerPoint presentation shortly, I just wanted to point out, I live in the country and you know what uh, broadband can be in a rural area. If for some reason we crash out, just stay patient. I can usually get back on again in less than a minute. So saying, let's see if we can't talk a little bit about moths and butterflies. And, oh. I think I need to hit share screen first. I'm going to get rid of myself. I'm going to share the screen. And there. Um, can anybody give me an indication that they are actually seeing a butterfly on their screen? Yeah, we're good, Don. Excellent. David. All right. So to, this evening, we're going to talk about the lep Lepidoptera, which are moths and butterflies. Um, and I really want to examine where, where they do they fit in the world. And we'll just sort of look a little bit at their life history, um, some of the different types we can find here in the county. And really just briefly, you know, fit, find out where Lepidopteris fit into this wonderful mosaic of life that we have on this planet. So to start, no surprise, Lepidoptera are insects. Uh, you know, there are only 33 orders of insects for the whole world, and 29 of them can be found in Ontario, which I find absolutely amazing that we've got that diversity right here in Ontario. Now, orders are a pretty big division. It's like a rodent, rodents are orders and primates are orders. So they're, they're, they're quite different one order to the next. So they are very large groupings. But with all those orders, interestingly, 80% of insects belong to just four orders. And those are the beetles, coleoptera, butterflies and moths, the lepidoptera, about 160,000 species in the world. The number keeps going up all the time as we discover more and more. Uh, wasps, bees, and ants, 115,000. And then flies, maybe 100,000, diptera. So you can see right away that the moths and butterflies must be important in the world. Uh, just as a little aside, it's, it's kind of 
amazing to note that those four orders all have complete metamorphism. And that's sort of the metamorphism we think about in insects where they lay an egg, they go into a, they hatch into a larva stage, which is all about eating and growing. They go into a resting stage, a pupa or a cocoon, and they transform rather miraculously into an adult, usually with wings. It's, uh, and the adult's all about reproduction. Uh, and that contrasts with the other type of, oh, sorry. Uh, and that kind of metamorphism, as I said, is what we're kind of used to uh, in as far as Lepidoptera go. We get that egg, it hatches into a caterpillar. Uh, young Lepidoptera are called caterpillars, no surprise. Um, and caterpillars are like all insects, even though they're soft and squishy, they actually have a, a hard echo, exoskeleton and they need to uh, they need to actually shed their skin and they usually end up eating their skin, don't wanna waste anything. Uh, so they shed their skin and then they get a little bit bigger and a little bit bigger. And every time they shed their skin, we call that an instar. So in, in, there's usually five or six different instars for uh, the Lepidoptera. And then they go into some kind of rest stage, a pupa in this case, and they turn into a, a moth in this case. And this contrasts with the other type of, of normal insect growth called incomplete metamorphism. And that's where the egg hatches into a miniature version of the adult. It doesn't go through a, a, a big change. It just gets bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. And then the adult has a, a usually identified with the fact that it has wings at the end. So let's, let's talk about Lepidoptera. And if you're on good terms with them, you can sort of just call them leps. Uh, a little friendly. So the leps are usually uh, divided into three groups. There's the moths, there's the butterflies, and there's the kind of butterflies, the skippers. And Lepidoptera, the, the name means actually scale wing, Optera is wing, and the scales are, are the what make up the pattern on the Lepidoptera. There's usually all kinds of scales, like a million scales on a, the wing of a, of a butterfly. And when it comes to butterflies, uh, the, the, uh, they're day flying mostly and those scales form quite bright patterns in, in many cases. And uh, this is, of course, everybody know what this butterfly is. It's, uh, it's the Viceroy, it's not the Monarch. And this is one of the great tragedies of Zoom. I have no interaction with people. When I ask questions, it's usually because I'm setting you up. So I can't get that feedback. But this is not a, a Monarch and most of you probably knew that. This is a Viceroy, it's, it looks like a Monarch. And you can tell by that black line that that's parallel to the back wing. Monarchs don't have that. So this is a Viceroy and they have bright, butterfly-like colors, sometimes for courtship, sometimes to tell other animals that you don't want to eat us because we're poison. Moths, on the other hand, tend to be uh, brownish, grayish. They're night flyers. Their patterns are all about camouflage because lots of things like to eat moths. And now, if you look at a moth on your porch after you left the light on all night, it doesn't look like camouflage is a very good, not working very well. But if you think about it in a, a natural state, you can start to appreciate that all those lines and blobs really do help it blend into the natural environment. The other thing Lepidoptera, all Lepidoptera share is they have that, that sucking tube that rolls out and it doesn't sting, doesn't pierce. So butterflies are very gentle insects and Lepidoptera are very gentle insects. And that's one, they're, one of the reasons they're such favorites with humans is they, they don't hurt us in any way. So yeah, I just mentioned butterflies and moths and maybe we just have a quick look at the difference between them. And if you ask your general person or even somebody who knows a little bit about moths and butterflies, what are some of the differences? Sometimes you say, well, you know, butterflies fly during the day, moths at night, butterflies land with wings closed, moths land with wings open. Uh, the pupa are exposed in butterflies and they're not in moths. Um, there's all kinds of exceptions to these rules, uh, which you probably know of yourself. 
Uh, here's a, this is a moth, it's a day flyer. It's not flying at night. It's quite pretty. Uh, this one eats uh, goldenrod. So you, you see it around uh, the fields. And when I say a moth or a butterfly eats something, I'm talking about the caterpillar. The adults all just tend to suck juices of some sort, but the caterpillar eats, eats. That's what a caterpillar does. So when I talk about a moth eating something, I'm talking about it, it's caterpillar. So the best way to actually talk about or divide a butterfly from a moth, and I admit you need some good eyesight for this, is butterflies all have clubbed antenna. And the skipper, which is a subset of the butterflies, those clubbed antenna are hooked. So all clubbed, all butterfly, all leps with clubbed antenna are butterflies, all leps with clubbed hooked antenna are skippers, and moths have antenna of various types, feathery or filaments or sort of half and half, but they're not clubbed. And that is, works perfectly for all our moths and butterflies. So there's our Lepidoptera, the, the three main types. And this is a little bit misleading because you look at this, and I, I just said there's three main types, but they're not equal in number. Here's a list of all the subfamilies of Lepidoptera in North America. So pretty big groups. And really what I just want to point out here is that with all this diversity, all this variation, butterflies and skippers are only one subfamily. So there's all kinds of different uh, variations on the Lepidoptera theme, and most of them fall into what we would call a moth. Uh, rule of thumb is for every butterfly species in an area, there's 20 moth species. And frankly, I think that's low. Um, so in Easternish Ontario County and a little bit and around the area, you probably have 110 species of butterflies. So we have well over 2,000 moth species, and I suspect we have well over 3,000 moth species in the area. So why so many different types? Well, I'm glad you asked that question. Um, there's so many different types because of the way that the, the butterfly or the moth evolves. Um, as I said, the caterpillars are the eating stage of the Lepidoptera. And many, many, many of them, almost all of them, have adapted to eat only a certain group of plants and sometimes only a certain species of plant. And that's the caterpillars eating. And I think most people are quite familiar with the idea that the monarch butterfly shown here, or the uh, monarch caterpillar, only eats milky. But it's not the only one that has a very specific diet. And, and matter of fact, they all do. And with all the different plants in the world that have evolved, the Lepidoptera have evolved with them. And every, every plant has its suite of Lepidoptera caterpillars that, that eat it and only it. So that's why you have a, a pink shaded fern moth that only eats ferns. You have a scarlet winged lichen moth that only eats lichens. And you have a raspberry parasta, which only eats, and I'm hoping some of you out there are at least whispering to yourselves raspberries. Uh, unfortunately, you'd be wrong. Set you up, sorry. Uh, they only eat mints. Uh, the raspberry comes from its color. Beautiful, a beautiful little moth. It's, it's less than a centimeter long, but beautiful. And butterflies are just the very same. Red admiral, haven't been a lot of red admirals around this year but their caterpillars only eat nettles. Uh, and there's our, our cabbage whites. Uh, we were talking a little bit about that earlier uh, before the show started. Uh, and cabbage whites, of course, only eat the broccoli in your gardens. If there's any gardeners out there, you know that. Well, they eat, a, they eat more than that. They eat anything in that cabbage family. But if you grow broccoli, you know all about cabbage whites and the little green caterpillars you got to pick off before you can eat them. So we have a huge number and diversity of Lepidoptera. So that's numbers. 
numbers and diversity of species, but what about volume? What about bulk? And one of the best illustrations I've ever seen on any natural topic is this one. This comes from the cover of an Algonquin trail guide. And what it's showing is the proportion by weight of animals in the, in the deciduous forest in midsummer in Algonquin. So if you took a square kilometer of deciduous forest in midsummer and you turned it upside down and you shook it and all the animals fell out and you divide them out by kind and then you weighed them and then drew them in proportion to their weight, you would see that even though bears are pretty big, they, you know, by weight in the forest, they're a pretty small component. These little dots, I don't know if you see them in the bottom there, they're, those are wolves. So they barely register. There's lots of chipmunks, lots of mice, fair number of birds, huge number of salamanders, I bet you didn't know. But when it comes to leaf eating caterpillars, that, that's far, far greater than everything else combined. So there's just millions of caterpillars in there munching away on leaves. So now we know there's lots of leps, great diversity, great number of species. There's lots of lept individuals, lots and lots of caterpillars out there. So I think we can now sort of make the assumption that moths are an important and integral part of the ecology of our habitats. They really fit into that mosaic of life. And I'm gonna come back to that number three point a little bit later, but I thought I'd just branch out a little bit and talk about the identification of Lepidoptera and uh, some of the ones we find around here. So the two books I use to identify uh, moths and butterflies now are the two at the top. The, uh, the, the ROM guide for butterflies is, is quite good and it's just Ontario. And the Peterson guide is, is good for moths. It's not complete. Like I said, there's probably 2000 moths around here. It's hard to fit that into a trail guide, a guide but there's lots of, lots of variety in there. And, and most of the ones you see are in there. Uh, the ones below, uh, the butterflies through binoculars is pretty good. Uh, it's the whole of Eastern North America though. So there's lots in there that we don't get. And the Papillon de Quebec is, is quite complete for Quebec. So it's almost complete for Ontario. Now the Papillon, when it comes to moths and butterflies, the old time guides always showed them pinned with their, their wings spread, which is, is quite all right if you're doing lab studies. Um, but nowadays, most people are more interested in, in just taking a picture of the live moth. And seeing the pin specimen is sometimes very difficult to relate to the way the, way the live moth uh, sits. And this example is, is extreme. This is the pin moth. And this is the way the moth looks when it's sitting on your porch under your light. So you can see how that would be very difficult to identify using the old style uh, guides. And that's why this Peters, not the old Peterson moth guide, but the new Peterson go moth guide, Dave Beetle and uh, Seabrook Lackey, Lackey, sorry. Um, and they're both from Ontario. So this is not only, uh, even though it's the Northeast North America, it's really Ontario. And their, their uh, guide shows them all in their live, uh, live the way they, they, they live. So it's much easier to uh, identify them with the real thing sitting under your porch light. You can also go online to see some cool things. Uh, this moth photographers group, uh, it's all of North America, though you can, you can get on, down just Ontario. And it has lots and lots and lots of pictures. It has very little information beyond the pictures though, but it's a good guide if you wanted to really delve into moths. And nowadays there's iNaturalist. I don't know how many people out there use iNaturalist, but you can take pictures. Anybody can take pictures and post them on here. And sometimes somebody else will identify them or you can go on in the explore section and just see if you can find what you're looking for. Uh, and this has really only been taken off in the last four or five years. And uh, 
you can see there's already three and a half million people signed up. So there's lots of uh, data being gathered. It's, it's going to be great. So if you're identifying Lepidoptera, that, that was all the, the adults, but you shouldn't forget about the caterpillars. Uh, some of the caterpillars are spectacular. That's a Cecropia caterpillar. And here's one that I saw for years, uh, it seeps goldenrod. I had no idea what it was. I couldn't figure out what it was. It's so spectacular. It looks like it's varnished. It's a beautiful caterpillar. And then this book came out on caterpillars, which I highly recommend. And lo and behold, the caterpillar I couldn't find was right on the, on the front cover. And that's a brown hooded owlet. And there's the adult. And I got to say, I've never seen the adult, but I've seen the caterpillar quite a few times. So you can get the idea of what's around sometimes better from caterpillars. You can also identify um, moths a little better by caterpillars. Here's two dagger moths. Uh, they look pretty similar. They're pretty hard to tell apart. But if you're in the area and you see the caterpillars, they look quite different. So caterpillars can really, really help out. Now, I've always had trouble finding caterpillars. Um, just, my eyesight's not good enough, I guess. So when, when I worked at the park, the way to find caterpillars was to go down to the nature center and see what the kids had brought in. Uh, their eyes were fabulous picking them out. So uh, that was the best way I found it. Get, your, get the kids out looking for them. But you got to be careful. You don't want to be fooled because this looks like a caterpillar. But let's look at a little more detail what what a caterpillar, which is the larva of a Lepidoptera, what, are, what its characteristics are. It has six legs. It has three pairs of legs, like, like all insects. And they're usually little spiky things up by the head. But then it has these prolegs. And they're the fleshy bits on the body. And but butterflies and moths only have one, two, or four pair of mid-abdominal prolegs, and then the anal uh, proleg at the back. So everything else is the mid-abdominal if you don't count the back one. So if we go back to this thing, which found crawling along, and count them, so you can see the, the true legs pretty well, but let's count the prolegs. There's one, two, three, four, five, six, and there's another one hidden in there, seven. So seven mid-abdominal prolegs, this is not a caterpillar. This is the larva of a, of a sawfly. And sawflies often are in groups as caterpillars, or sorry, <laughs> as larva. Um, Europeans pine sawfly, the introduced one, as you can guess. Uh, the willow sawfly, fairly spectacular looking. And they are often in these groups that, that do this kind of funny little sawtooth behavior when they're disturbed, whether they're trying to look like the teeth of a bigger animal or something to, to scare whatever is around away, maybe. And the adult of a sawfly oh, is, is, is kind of a, uh, looks more like a wasp. Anyway, so now I'm jumping back to the, the variety of, of moths. Uh, all these different super families. The ones in green are the ones we call the macro, the big moths, and then of course butterflies and skippers. And these are what we usually see. All the other ones are, are quite small. So just looking at these big ones, some of the types that we, we can see are the silkworm moths. These are the big ones. There's about six or seven species in the area. They all fly in June. Uh, and this is the only silkworm moth I've ever found away from a light. This is Macaulay Mountain Conservation Area. area. Can everybody see the, the silkworm moth? As I was walking down the trail, I saw it. It's right there. It's a, a beautiful luna moth. Just absolutely spectacular. And you can see how the camouflage would work if it was on a leafy branch instead of on a bark. Uh, but there's there's several several there's like I say there's six or seven of these big big silkworm moths. Uh, sphinx moths are also big. They tend to have this delta wing shape. Uh, most people are more familiar with their caterpillars, which are often hornworms. And yes, the tomato hornworm is one of the 
one of the Sphinx moths. Here's another Sphinx moth. You might be lucky enough to see it at your garden if you're quick enough to pick it up. Do you see it flying around? A lot of people think these look like hummingbirds, and they certainly do. But that's actually a day flying sphinx moth. And that's called the uh, clear wing, hummingbird clear wing. There's a still of it. So you can see the, the scales, even though it's a Lepidoptera, half its wings don't have scales. Beautiful, beautiful butterfly coming to beautiful garden plants. Uh, there's geometer or inchworm moths. They all tend to land so that you can see the front and back wings and the pattern just sort of flows from one to the other. Usually a very broad looking uh, moth. And they're called geometers because the caterpillars have only one mid-abdominal prolate. So that means when they wanna crawl along, they gotta scooch their back end up, anchor it, and then throw their front end ahead and anchor their true legs and then bring the back leg up again. So they, they move in this inchworm type fashion. And that's what inchworms are. They're actually the caterpillars of geometro moths, geometer moths. Tiger moths are, are often big and hairy and they don't move much once they've landed for the day and they can be quite pretty, including my favorite all time moth, the great tiger moth which I have not seen in the county, but I have seen just north of the county. Uh, another group are the catocala or underwing moths. Uh, and they, they are out right now. They're a, a late flying moth, usually in August, September. And they have a great camouflage pattern on the front wings, which usually covers up the back wings. And then when they're disturbed, they flash their back colored back wings. Uh, theory being that it, it startles the, the predator and it uh, can get away. Then there's the caterpillars, which in Lepidoptera that people don't like, uh, tent caterpillars. There's two, two, two species of tent caterpillar. Uh, the eastern is the one that makes the, the tent and the forest actually just makes webs. Um, and they are, a little bit destructive, depending on their cycle they're in, but they are native and they tend to eat the leaves early in the season so that the tree can actually grow a second crop of leaves or tree or bush and and gets a, you know, doesn't really harm it that much. Uh, this one you may have seen flying around this year, particularly north of the county. The county hasn't been hit too hard, but this is the, the, form, the moth formerly called the gypsy moth. Uh, they're tending to go away from that name now, but uh, it cycles, it's been around for decades and it cycles up and down. And when it's, it's very high, it can really eat a lot of leaves. If you go up to the Highway 7 corridor, you can see all leaves have been stripped. And they're, they're a summer feeding caterpillar, so they do damage the, the trees worse. So that's why a lot of people want to spray for them. And the argument is, well, you're spraying a natural bacteria, a Bt, that only kills leaf-eating caterpillars. But if you hearken back to that uh, Algonquin uh, book, you can see that killing leaf-eating caterpillars in a forest is you're taking away a lot of the biomass of that forest. So it's not something you want to do lightly. And then all those yellow ones, those are all called micromoths, and they come in all kinds of shapes and forms, usually less than a centimeter. And we'll just leave those for another day, but they're pretty cool. Butterflies, the skippers I mentioned, they're usually small and orange, difficult to identify. Uh, this is one of the easier ones to identify. This is the Arctic skipper, and it's got that mottled pattern. Uh, swallowtails are a favorite butterfly. This is the giant swallowtail. And before 2008, you wouldn't find this in the county. In 2008, it moved north, and it established uh, colonies here. And it flies twice. There's one brood in May and then there's another brood that's flying right now. 
Uh, giant swallowtail is an example of a species that has moved north. And its caterpillar eats uh, the prickly ash and it kind of looks like bird droppings. There's all kinds of cool uh, butterflies called uh, hair streaks. And they're all quite pretty and they're all fairly rare in the county except this one. This is the juniper hair streak and it eats junipers and the juniper it eats is the red cedar, which is really a juniper. And red cedar is only really found in Canada in the Quinty area and in the Ottawa Valley. So this is very much a, a, a Quinty uh, specialist. You don't find this in too many places in Canada except around here, juniper hair streak. And of course, there's the, the most famous butterfly of all the monarch. And I wanted to just talk about the monarch story a little bit. Uh, part of the reason is you're having a monarch day coming up. And also it's a really cool story and it's a really cool Canadian story. And monarchs are just so well known. This is just something we we're doing at the park. You can see everybody likes to dress up as monarchs. They like to hold monarchs. They like to, to look at monarchs. And I think most people know the story that the entire Eastern North American population of monarchs migrates down to a few mountaintops in central Mexico, spends the winter down there, and then starts coming back in a series of generations. It takes maybe three generations to get back to Ontario, but only one generation goes down and then comes part, part way back. So that's, we know that now. Back when I was a kid, we didn't know that. We didn't know where the, the monarchs went. And Dr. Uh, Urquhart here, Fred Urquhart, and his uh, wife, Nora, they, he was an entomologist. And even as a kid, he knew that the monarchs were going somewhere but he didn't know where. So the two of them started up a, you know, this is not his main job. This is just his, his passion and his interest, this Monarch uh, Information Center. And they were trying to figure out where the monarchs went. And they knew they had to tag the monarch and then find that tag monarch somewhere in the winter. And the big sticking point, uh, which is a poor pun here, in the early years between 1937 and 1952 is they couldn't figure out or find a tag that would stick to a monarch without affecting it. But during that time, uh, the, you know, industry is, is in, in, in progressing and they came up with uh, an adhesive to use on their uh, groceries and that worked for the monarchs. So in 1952, and here's his, Tag using. They put out a notice in a number of papers saying they were looking for people to tag monarchs in Canada and the Northeast United States. Uh, this one's a little bit later. This is in the 1952, but it's something like this. And 12 people answered that ad. And one of the people that answered that ad is the woman on the right. That's uh, Audrey Wilson. And she had a cottage at the park. Uh, she's still around. She still tags butter. She's been tagging monarchs for over 60 years. So I think that's pretty cool. So anyway, they were tagging these butterflies. They were tagging these butterflies. They were flying off in a southerly direction and nobody knew where they were going. And then in the 70s, an American expat in Mexico noticed a lot of monarchs up in the mountains. And he contacted Fred Urquhart and Fred said, I need you to find a tag. And they looked for a tag and they looked for a tag and they never found a tag. So in the seventies, Fred and his wife went to Mexico to this spot uh, and a National Geographic crew went with them and they walked up into the mountain and he wasn't there two minutes and he looked down on the ground and he saw a butterfly with a tag and it was one of his tags conclusive proof that the butterflies of Eastern North America were going to this spot in central Mexico. So we, we figured out, civilization figured out what the, what the monarchs were doing. And in 76, this National Geographic uh, article came out 
Uh, and again, I, that, that came out when I was in high school. And I remember getting this, uh, the family, we got National Geographic and reading about this, the monarchs. Now, now everybody knows about the monarch story. Uh, they're still tagging monarchs. We do it more for education now. We, we know where they go. Uh, but more for education. And anybody can tag a monarch. Uh, the air carts are both gone now. Uh, the monarch watch is based in the States now. But you can uh, write for tags. And they come in this yellow envelope. And you can tag your monarch and send that information in. And more and more data can be gathered for the monarchs. A lot of school kids do this. We do this at the park. Don Davis has been doing this at the park for over 30 years, having uh, he comes in on Labor Day weekend, uh, pre-COVID obviously here, and uh, tags butterflies. Now he's, I believe, going to be at your uh, at your Monarch Day this weekend coming up. He's a great guy. He's a, an expert on monarchs. And you know, you put the tag on, you let the monarch go. It catches the attention of a lot of people. Um, and just 27,000 monarchs have been tagged at Presque Isle alone over those 30 some years. And those are just the ones that Don Davis did. Other people have done more. And you can see the tag has evolved a little bit from the one on the, the wing edge. And we are very lucky here in the county. We live on the shoreline of the great inland sea, Lake Ontario. And migrating things tend to pile up a little bit along the shoreline. And so we have the opportunity of seeing a lot of monarchs together. Um, they like, they need to fuel up before they can get across the lake. And that fuel might be nectar from some asters, or it might be the juices from a dead duck lying on the shore or a mud puddle. It's, it's all energy for them. And this is, sometimes you just see a whole bunch of monarchs. This is uh, September 2008 at Presque Isle. And there was about 10,000 monarchs in one tree that, that day. It was just the right conditions with the wind direction. You can find this on YouTube. If you just do a search for monarch migration Presque Isle, you can find this little video. You can see it's a little bit before my high definition camera. But And there is just a lot of monarchs flying around. Oh, uh, David, your picture is not showing for everyone. Oh, the video? Yeah. I don't know how to fix that, but it's gone now. There was a lot of monarchs in the tree. Sorry. Um, I wonder if... Yeah, I'm going to have to leave it. We can try again later, maybe. So we, we're just about done here now. We've, we've shown that there's lots of different Lepidoptera, lots of diversity. Uh, there's lots of individuals, lots of caterpillars out there. And moths and butterflies are intuitively, we can say that they're an important and integral part of the ecology of our habitats. And I just want to look at one example of that third statement. And this is an example brought in by uh, Dr. Talamy from Rhode Island. And he just has a, a perfectly simple little story. He had a chickadee nest outside his window. So he started um, watching the chickadee bring food. And birds, all kinds of birds, when they feed their young, need protein. Even birds that we think as seed eaters like sparrows need protein for their babies and so they they go after caterpillars a lot of them go after caterpillars and he watched the chickadee nest though and he found that to raise four baby chickadees takes six thousand to nine thousand caterpillars just to get them out of the nest that's a lot of caterpillars and then he went out in the yard and he walked around four trees in his yard one was a white oak. It had 230. He sees caterpillars a lot better than I do. He saw 233 caterpillars of 15 species in a quick walk around. The black cherry, 
had 53 caterpillars of 10 species. And then the last two plants, just a, just a couple of caterpillars, one species. And I think you probably can guess that the first two are native plants and the last two are non-native plants. And it really just comes down to some couple of take home lessons here. If we want our ecosystem to work, we need to have that diversity. And so what we need to do is we need to preserve wild places and plants that grow there. And that's something that the South Shore people are doing, uh, trying to protect that area all along the South Shore of Prince Edward County. And the other thing we can all do is just plant native plants everywhere in your garden. Uh, this is a way station, but it's supposed to be good for the monarchs nectaring to get through the states because the states with their genetic modified fields have gotten rid of a lot of, a lot of plants, unfortunately, that uh, monarchs would use. But you really want all kinds of plants. You want leafy plants that the, the caterpillars are going to eat and you want to just let them eat them. You know, if they're they're not gonna to strip them bare, but you want those caterpillars all over the place for the birds, for other insects, because they're they're cool to look at, moths and butterflies, but they're really more than just uh, a meme, a social uh, little joke. They really are part of the mosaic of life, and they're really quite important a part of that that you have right in your backyard or hopefully you have right in your backyard. And that's all I have to say. And I hope there's people out there because you really don't know when you're doing web. <laughs> all right. Um, if anyone has any questions for David, uh, please feel free to put them in the chat box. Um, David, I don't know if you have the chat box open, but we have a lot of people saying um, that that was an excellent presentation. And well, thank you. Thank you. It was great. Um, Stephen mentioned that it was a great lesson to preserve the food web, of course. Um, all right. Oh, and we have a first question. So, uh, have the swallowtails moved north due to climate change? Have the swallowtails moved north? Why? Due to climate change. Well, who knows for sure? Maybe. Maybe. Um, there's lots and lots of animals that have moved north in the last hundred years. Uh, but you also have to remember that human influence in this part of the world has changed the ecology of this world quite a bit as well of, of North. And this used to be a thick forest and probably they wouldn't have liked the thick forest because prickly ash grows on the edges. Maybe, I mean, there's a lot, a lot of incidental in, uh, evidence like that for, for climate change, but it's not the only variable. Sorry, I'm trying to figure out how to show myself. But Just uh, click stop sharing screen. That should. Oh yes, sir. <laughs> Thank you. There you go. All right. Um, we have a tech advisor. <laughs> um, yeah. So we have a couple more people saying that that was great. Really looking forward to Monarch Day. Um, yes. Yep. Uh, excellent as usual from uh, Cheryl. Does anyone have any other questions for David? I have a question. How many people out there had broccoli that the cabbage butterflies eat? Uh, oh, uh, we have a question. Is your three volume set on Prince Edward County still available? The Prince Edward Field Naturalist gave a copy to every library in the county. Or maybe not every copy, maybe, maybe just the Picton one. So whether they still have it or not, I don't know. Um, and that was done almost 20 years ago. And our knowledge is so much more, particularly on insects. Uh, so it's it's out of date already, but it's a, it's a start. And in there, you'll actually, 
you'll actually find that the Royal Ontario Museum made an expedition to the wilds of Prince Edward County in the uh, 1940s and, and did a bunch of looked at insects. And you'd be interested to know one Fred Urquhart was on that. And one of the other interesting things is there were no deer in Prince Edward County back then. So things do change. Uh, another question. What is a rare county butterfly or moth that we should be on the uh, lookout for? Uh, far as native ones, um, that that juniper hair streak is is kind of cool. Um, I've seen it in about three or four spots in the county, but there might be more, certainly on private land. And uh, you look in areas of red cedar with not thick red cedar, but scattered red cedar and flowers that grow in between so that the adults have something to nectar on. Uh, that's not a bad one. The other, some of those skippers are a little bit on. Unusual, I wouldn't call them rare though. And then the other rare things we get are weird Southern ones that just come up occasionally. And they're more of an interest than a real ecological importance because they're, they're just here for the, the day that the buckeye is a great, the beautiful buckeye butterfly. It comes up some summers, almost most summers now, another, another change and it, its larva eats the plant that grows at uh, Sandbanks and Presque Isle. And it's a, it's a cool one to see. Like I say, it's not really an ecological importance because they, they all die off in the winter. Uh, do you have a favorite lep? Do I have a, sorry? A favorite lep. A favorite, I like that giant, I like that giant uh, tiger moth beautiful colors and then when it comes to butterflies i like the challenge of trying to figure out the skippers but uh well, who you know who doesn't like a monarch and uh the swallowtails are big and exciting and what flowers attract butterflies They'd like to plant some flowers. So yeah, there is something called a butterfly bush. It, it's just at the range. And here's a non-native plant I'm talking about. Terrible. Um, but the nectar really attracts them. But it, it's right at the range of North Range here. So they don't always live and survive the winter in, in yards. Um, echinacea is good. Dahlias are good. Uh, and I say that because we just planted them in our yard. And they're really attracting the butterflies. Uh, but I, almost any of those things that have, uh, have flowers are good for butterflies. Are there caterpillars that we need to avoid touching or letting them on our skin? Kids are always asking this. Yeah. Uh, if, an in, if a caterpillar is hairy, there is a chance it can irritate the skin. And it's just irritate. Uh, there are no caterpillars that irritate my old wrinkled skin around here, but there are some, particularly if you're a kid and your skin's a little bit thin. And the, the, the famous one people tend to talk about is the hickory tussock moth. It's, it's a uh, white with a few black bristles and those bristles are barbed and they break off in the skin. Um, and they're just, you know, they're little, making little micro cuts on your skin and it's, it's an irritation. It's nothing really dangerous though. Um, they don't inject poison or anything, but, but hairy caterpillars have hairs to protect themselves. So that's, that's what they're doing. Somebody gave up on growing broccoli. Yeah, they're, <laughs> they're around. And uh, oh, there's a good website somebody gave us. Yeah. Yeah, someone just posted a great website. I don't think the attendees can see it, um, but it is a presentation on which native plants host which caterpillars. And I will post that link um, to the email that I'm going to send all of you with the YouTube recording. Yeah, the, the internet is just full of great, great resources nowadays. Uh, another good, uh, the Fletcher Wildlife Garden in Ottawa has a good website as well. All right, does anyone have any other 
last minute questions for David before we wrap things up? You're welcome, Agneta. So thank you very much, David, for giving us a wonderful presentation on butterflies and moss. And it seems like a lot of people learned a lot of things about butterflies and moss, which is great. Um, for anyone who wasn't paying attention to this presentation, we have the Flight of the Monarch Day upcoming uh, this Saturday from 2 to 5. And as David mentioned, we will have Dawn um, doing a demonstration on monarch tagging, so you can learn all about that. Uh, you can help collect um, scientific data on monarch caterpillars in the um, monarch meadow and take home a free monarch craft for your kids. And on Wednesday, September 1st, um, we will be showcasing the Shoreline documentary, um, which is a special presentation by A Greener Future, and it showcases um, their executive director, Rochelle, as she paddles 420 kilometers across Lake Ontario um, to basically raise awareness for plastic pollution in the Great Lakes. Um, this is a fundraiser event for A Greener Future and their, their uh, program, um, and more information can be found on their website. And on Saturday, September 18th, we will have our very first and hopefully annual South Shore cleanup. Um, so if you want to join us, help clean up Ostrander Crown Land Block and Point Peter um, Provincial Wildlife Area, all the roads and beaches would be great. Um, again, more information can be found on our website. And after the cleanup, we're going to have some games and prizes and a little talk um, by Rochelle afterwards at the Hudgen House. Um, and yeah, those are all our upcoming events. Again, uh, thank you, David, for taking the time to give us this wonderful presentation. Well, and, thank you very much for your interest. It was great. And yeah, um, again, this has been recorded, so we're going to send it all out to the participants so you can watch it again and uh, learn even more about butterflies and monarchs. All right. Have a good night, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Bye.